It's Truck Month. It's our favorite month of the year at Lithia Ford of Boise. Time to pick up savings, pick up power, pick up fun. And the best place to pick up yours? Lithia Ford of Boise, where Ford begins in Idaho. Hey, Forrest here. Nothing like getting paid. And with ICCU's mobile app, I can deposit checks or accept Zelle payments so the money hits my account fast. I just wish there was an app for mowing the rest of these lawns. Get ready for the time of your life at Circa Resort and Casino, Las Vegas' newest destination for fun. Featuring the world's biggest poolside tailgate party with three levels of action, six pools, and a 143-foot screen. The fun is always on deck with all the games all year long. Stadium Swim, located in downtown Las Vegas on Fremont Street. Book the time of your life today at CircaLasVegas.com. RowPaint.com. RowPaint.com is going all in this season with an all-star lineup. It's Coach Leon Rice and Andy Rowe. Oh, no. Want to just paint my house? When I want Boise State to win, I trust Coach Rice to lead the Broncos to victory. And when I want the best painting and garage floor coating, I trust RowPaint.com to get that job done right. It's time for Ball Talk with Sanford and Johnny. From what's happening on the blue at Boise State to the Mountain West and beyond. The biggest storylines, the best guests, and most outlandish opinions from two dudes who eat, sleep, and breathe college football. Today's broadcast is coming from the Cutwater Spirits Can Cocktail Studios. Check out one of their more than 30 flavors of pre-mixed premium cocktails at your local gas station or grocery store. Cutwater Can Cocktails is perfect for your next game day tailgate party. Ball Talk with Sanford and Johnny, featuring former Boise State quarterback and longtime coach Mike Sanford and KTIK 95.3 FM, the tickets, Johnny Mallory on Bronco Nation News. I love that guitar solo. Does that intro, does our intro pump you up to Sandman? It has to. I love that intro, and I think whoever made it, I think it, if it's BJ who's uh, producing the show right now, whoever it was did a great job. Um, I think it's uh, it almost it's a little emotional, you know, looking back at some of the the moments. Yeah. But I, you know, I have a couple highlights in there from my coaching career, but none of them compare to the highlight of you jumping into that pool. Uh, it just it gets me every time, and and I think that we need to add the highlight of you jumping over 20 inches in your vertical jump at Boise State's Pro Day. That needs to be uh, BJ. Yeah, BJ is producing this edition of Ball Talk. By the way, spring edition, episode four, ball game in the Sandman coming at you. Going to get after some scrimmage stats. Going to build a wide receiver room. Uh, got a oh, God, terrific mic drop. Oh, and BJ, yeah, BJ oh, produced. Who's that? It's on TV. What do we think? 10, 12? What's the uh... shoebox? BJ trying to throw throw some heat at you. Why are you guys doing this? BJ, get off it. You know what? All I can say on that, there. all I can say is that the effort was absolutely elite. It was I, I'm, I'm still pissed off I didn't touch this piece. I should have touched this last one, guys. I just missed it, and I know exactly what I did wrong, Sanford. You don't have to to coach me on that one. I, you don't want to wave your hand. No, you don't want right. to do a vertical jumping up and grabbing it. You it, want to go straight up. Just straight up and then just like a little boop. Yes, and 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 I choked. It was the Jet Scout behind me, man. I didn't want to be drafted by the Jets, man. I was like, shit. What this guy gonna take? Did I blame you? 
can anybody blame you? I mean, outside of maybe getting a, a, a few snaps in with Aaron Rodgers after he, you know, trots onto the field triumphantly with the American flag. There's uh, not a whole lot of great stuff about being a New York Jet. It's that not, was sad. It's not what you're looking for. That was sad. Um, so yeah, we're gonna get after it today on Ball Talk. Uh, let's start with the spring scrimmage and um, don't don't bring the stats up just yet, BJ, but. Just start with coach. I mean, you get your first spring scrimmage. You've had these. You close it up. You don't want people seeing. Uh, what essentially are you running? Your offense, what you've done the last couple of weeks defensively too. How do the coaches essentially coordinate a spring scrimmage? Yeah, the closed scrimmages, meaning that there's no media availability, no fans, are typically when you do the most. Uh, you do the most schematically you you know you do some things that maybe you've experimented with and you know with some new ideas obviously with Dirk Cutter as the offensive coordinator I, I would assume that there's some things that weren't on tape in 2023 uh, that would be run at a closed um, session of a spring scrimmage and same thing will happen in the fall typically the open to the public uh, you just you just go in there and just call your day one day two install offenses and defenses uh, you do the stuff that you put on film last year, uh, you know, which at times can be a little bit challenging. Uh, if if you're, you know, going into a new environment, you're a new coordinator. I've been in that situation several times, you know, and, and so you do have your own personality as a play caller and you don't want to tip your hat too much uh, with regards to how you will go about running an offense. Uh, but I do think that the closed uh, scrimmages are are really good to see more about the operation side of things because you're going to probably get, a little bit more wordy in some of your play calls. You want to see how quarterbacks are able to spit it out either in the huddle or, you know, commanding the line of scrimmage with the communication needed at the line of scrimmage. Um, so there's a lot that goes into a closed, no media, no fan scrimmage that shows you probably more about your team than you would if it was open to the media, open to the fans. But I do like the open to the fans, open to the media format as well because then you get a lot of questions answered about, how are certain guys that maybe haven't played under the bright lights and haven't played with pomp and circumstance of a college football game? How are they going to respond to that? Um, so I think you do kind of get a little bit of value both from the closed and the open scrimmage format, both in spring and fall camp. Yeah, um, for quarterbacks in particular. And we'll get the stats here in a second, but uh, three quarterbacks played. And you look at the statistically, man, probably played pretty well. Um, how do you divvy the reps? You How many do you want to make sure you see just in that quarterback room, Coach Sanford, before a spring scrimmage like that, especially in a situation like this? It's a little unique. Um, one of the players, Maddox Madsen, isn't participating. Malachi Nelson is just getting his feet wet. C.J. Tiller got his feet wet a little bit last year. And then there's kind of Colt Fulton, you know, the, the Santa Margarita gunslinger, just kind of staying there saying, hey, you give me reps, I'm going to make the most of them too. Yeah, I, I think that the, just looking at the scrimmage stats, and we can get into them in a second, uh, it seems like just, you know, the, the thing that I saw is that it looks like three quarterbacks that played uh, we're efficient. We're moving the football, uh, let a touchdown drive, at least had a touchdown pass, probably let a few others. Um, we don't know exactly the drive breakdown on the stats that were released to the media, uh, mm -hmm. but it does seem like there is going to be an interesting quarterback situation. Uh, and I, I think that that's a good sign. Uh, it can also be challenging, but I do uh, think that seeing Malachi Nelson finish out uh, and you can pop those stats on the screen, the quarterback stats, but seeing Malachi Nelson, um, you know, end up with 70% completion percentage uh, on seven of 10 for 73 yards, a touchdown, no interceptions. Uh, CJ Tiller, uh, who I'm going to be getting into a little bit here, talking about some of my impressions of young CJ Tiller, but five of nine, 63 yards, a touchdown, no interceptions. And then Colt Fulton, uh, you know, the, the walk on quarterback that, uh, I think was ready if if his number was called upon to play and deliver. And I think he's continuing that trend. I mean, he, he led all passers with 108 yards. Oftentimes in a, in a scrimmage situation, sometimes the threes, and I'm not saying that Colt Fulton necessarily got the threes in the spring scrimmage, uh, number one, but a lot of times the threes do end up getting more extended reps. That you was you my question getting, there. You, you end up extending those guys, and it's almost like what you want, once you get what you need from the ones – then you kind of get to, oh, all right, let's see how much we can get with the twos. And then it becomes uh, really a, a young guy or, you know, so, and in some cases a walk-on type of a scrimmage scenario. And those are so valuable. And I think a lot of times, you know, the fan base, if they're at a spring game, they're like, oh, none of these guys are going to be playing. Never heard of these guys. 
you know, a lot of times those those types of moments are where you can make a name for yourself. And uh, big hat, you know, my, tip my cap to Colt Fulton for his continued growth and and readiness to be a great player. Um, you know, I think you look at the receivers. Uh, I think the the number one thing that jumps off the page to me is Prince Strawn, you know, in only four catches had 71 yards. So you uh, can assume that there was a deep connection. Um, if you look at the numbers, it might it might end up matching up that a Malachi Nelson threw him uh, some type of down the field throw. Uh, but, you, you know, you see Austin Bolt, my guy, love Austin Bolt. Mustache is on point. He's got yes. it all greased up and ready to roll. Uh, Austin Bolt, the uh, the local product out of Bora High School, go Lions. Um, he, he, you know, he, he just continues to be a guy that I think is going to have a big impact uh, on this, on this offense. Um, you know, and then you look at Chase Penry, Chase Penry was a guy that I coached. You at, did, at, you at, did at university of Colorado. I love Chase Penry. Uh, P Penry's Mr. Reliable, great route runner. He reminds me personality wise, uh, very similar to, uh, and I, I'm not going to say he's a white wide receiver. So, you know, you compare, uh, you know, but he's a, he reminds me of Spurbeck. Um, he, he has, a, there's a lot of similarities to Thomas Spurbeck in his game. Um, he's got explosiveness. He can go out, he can reach out and, and make plays. He did battle some degenerative, uh, you know, hip conditions while he was at CU. And it's so good for me to see that he is fully up and running because we weren't able to play him in 2022 as much as I wish that I, we would have as the offensive coordinator. Uh, but I think Chase Penry is going to be a guy on third downs. Look for him. Uh, he's going to find the open zones. He's going to settle in those zones. He has a great understanding of breaking down underneath coverage. I do think he fits into the slot mold, but uh, because of his intellect, his ability to go up in high point of football, I think Chase Penry is a guy that can certainly play a Z, which is the outside off the ball line of scrimmage receiver. Uh, but he, he's going to be versatile. He's, he's got a lot of uh, just uh, intellect as it relates to the game of football. And he's had a really uneven journey, man. He's gone through a lot of adversity. Uh, Latrell Capel is a player I'm really excited to, to have a chance to really watch. I didn't have a chance to see him in 23 uh, but have watched some highlights of his 22 uh, campaign. I think he's going to be explosive. He's dynamic. Uh, I think that you look at these numbers, three catches, 16 yards, did score a touchdown. You know, you don't want to necessarily bring a guy who's coming off of being injured and just just throw him out there and get him a ton of reps in the first totally. line of scrimmage. So, you know, get 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 him the feel of getting hit a little bit, run routes, uh, you know, and, and, and run after catch opportunities against live tackling. Uh, I do think that Latrell Capels will continue to trend uh, in being potentially the number one receiver because of his experience. Um, you know, running the football, Sire Gaines, the guy that you talked about, he looks like a monster. Uh, young Buck, is he uh, finishing it? This is the end of his true freshman year, uh, or did he just get here in January? He just got here in January. He should be getting ready for prom night. There we go. There we go. And then and then Ashton Genty and Bruzy Dubar didn't play. Uh, I would say that Ashton Genty probably shouldn't be tackled until the the trip to Georgia Southern. I think that's a really <laughs> good plan. Uh, you got to be who you can afford to be, and I think that's exactly what uh, what Boise State will and should do. Um, but yeah, uh, two for thirteen on third down. You know, I'd say that's, that's where I want to talk to you on. We'll get back yeah. to the receivers too, because I wanted you to build us a receiver room tonight, Coach. And I love this receiver room that Matt Miller has. But you saw the efficiency, two for thirteen. I mean, you don't know what quarterback was there. I mean, could could five of those have been Colt Fulton, your third guy in the third team? Uh, you know, is there anything you can say without having seen that? Just the two of thirteen efficiency, obviously, is something that. Uh, that, that, that I'm sure they'll be showing them on tape. The the one thing, uh, third down efficiency in a scrimmage, don't forget that the coaches make the, they, they script out the situations and the scenarios uh, of the scrimmage. So a lot of times okay. the third downs can actually be a third down live scrimmage uh, where you go like third and three is the first play. Then you go down third and five is the next play. Third and seven is the next play. Third and nine, 11, 13. Yeah. Uh, okay. And so, you, you, to, to be able to say that these are normal game type stats, I wouldn't look too much into that. I think it does look good for the defense, to, you know, uh, getting stops, getting off the field on 11 of 13, uh, tri you know, opportunities to play third down defense. Uh, I think that's that's a positive sign for the defense. And then you can see the scoring plays. Uh, I don't know how many plays uh, that, that you had in this scrimmage. Looking at the quarterback stats, I would guess that you had nearly 100 plays. Um, and based off 100 plays, you know, five touchdowns, pretty even performance between offense and defenses would be uh, kind of my my assessment of just looking between the tea leaves uh, of what happened in this stat that was released by Boise State. 
Yeah, I mean, you got to look at that, too. I mean, when the offense isn't doing something, maybe that's when the defense is playing well. And, you know, obviously both units, both teams, both sides of the ball got to eat. Coach Sanford. So, uh, yeah. So you say about a hundred plays. Um, that seems, that, that seems like a lot of work, right? Good work in. I mean, is that kind of the ideal 80 to a hundred plays? Yeah. It, it's funny. This is why we call it ball talk. We're not just going to talk about Boise state stats. We're going to go back to some history of, of, you know, scrimmages I've been a part of, you know, I've been a part of scrimmages where you got 45 total live plays. And at certain places I've coached at, you know, once you just need, you needed to just get some tackling, you needed some live work. You might not have had the bodies to go, you know, ones versus ones, twos versus twos, threes versus threes. And then even if there's a couple of injuries that happen in a live scrimmage, you're like, yeah, let's shut this thing down. We're good. Um, but then I've also been a part of uh, Jim Harbaugh where uh, the very first spring game that I was a part of, yeah. Uh, we ended up getting, I believe it was over 225 live snaps at a scrimmage. And we had so few bodies. I mean, you had guys that were like, they were trained as corners that had to go play linebacker just to finish the dang thing. And it That's wasn't hilarious. scripted. It was like Coach Harbaugh, go, Jim goes out, puts the ball down and like, hey, we're playing football. And we're, let's tackle. And, uh, and there was no, hey, we're going to go this long. It was, hey, we're going to go until... Jim Harbaugh decides that we've gotten enough work and we did it to the tune of like 200. I don't know. It was a million plays. Do and players absolute- look at you like coach? Are we, are we really doing this to the position coaches? And you guys are like, yeah, get out there. I mean, that and, must and, be. And not just that, but you think about it, as an offensive coordinator, if you're coming in with a little bit of a, of a tight call sheet and I wasn't the coordinator, um, but if you're an offensive or defensive coordinator, there's never a time in your life where you've called 250 consecutive plays. Never. I mean, the most you ever call is about 80. 85 yep. to 105. So it, it was the coaches. They were like, "What are we done? Are we going to finish this thing up?" You know, players are looking around like, what, what, "What are we doing?" But that right there, what Jim Harbaugh did at Stanford in year one, and that's when this happened, which was in 2007. That is why that team became the biggest bully on the block, certainly in West Coast football. Yep. Became the most physical team, and it they was were. It, you were getting hardened by how you were trained. And that team became, uh, I think it, it it cornered the market for physicality and running the football and tackling and guys just being, you know, just junkyard dogs. It was dogs, weird as a, as, a, as a college football geek and historian kind of at the time. I wasn't really even into my media career then. I was trying to get there. But it was weird than when Stanford, they were always the smart guy. Yep. But when Jim got there and you were part of that staff, they turned into the tough guy. They really did. Stanford became tough and they never had, it was like my Seahawks. They were always soft. That was the term with Seattle soft. When beast mode arrived, all of a sudden the whole team was tough basically because you had one guy beast mode saying, this is how I play and I'm going to pick everybody up. But you guys were able to do that. Obviously Harbaugh's staff there at Stanford physical ball. It was so non Stanford. And that was such a beauty of it too. That was a hell of an era for Stanford football. Probably something they'll never ever, ever even come close to duplicating. And I don't know again. how, I don't know how you could get back to that. Uh, you know, really with the, 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 the transfer portal and NIL, uh, it was almost like, it was like Jim Harbaugh. I would say, I would say he, he did have some, there was some, some foresight about what he was going to do and how he wanted to build this program in his image. But it, it was as if he reached inside of the brain of every player at Stanford by how we trained, by how we practiced, by how we went about our business and talked them into being a tough guy. And usually when you're the guy that's been in five AP, seven AP courses, exactly. in high school, that's you're, not necessarily you. You're but not the tough it. guy. Yeah. And, and it was beautiful to be a part of, beautiful to watch, and I'll, I'll never forget it. And, like, people always say, like, what was it about, you know, Coach Jim Harbaugh that made you guys so physical? I just say it's because we just put the ball down on the field and played a whole heck of a lot of live tackle. And you didn't, you didn't get burned that way? I mean, because nowadays, I mean, Ashton Genty, you said it, and I agree. I don't want him tackled until Georgia Southern. When you were at Boise State as a player, how did – Dirk, Hawk, Pete, how did they coordinate these springs? And I mean, that was 20 something years ago now. 
I mean, were you guys going full 100%? And do you, do they still do that? It feels like even now there's going to be real quick whistles. Get up, get up, get up. Anytime someone hits the ground, all the coaches freak out. Get up, get up. I don't know why you guys do that, but yeah. <laughs> I look back. I look back to my time as a player. You know, book first under Dirt Cutter and Mark Helfrich. You know, in in two thousand, the year two thousand, and then two thousand one through two thousand four, and from that entire time, one thing that that we did that I have always been a huge advocate of is that when we went live scrimmage, uh, move the ball either in the context of practice or in a Saturday scrimmage, just like Boise State just had. When we did that, the quarterbacks were always live. And I just absolutely loved it. 100% and I think of, live. Because you don't get used to working the pocket until you've touched the hot stove. You know, and you make some mistakes and, we're, and over, you know, over climbing in the pocket or taking too big of a sidestep, you, you run into the, you run into a, you know, a defensive tackle that's coming through and you, you learn a lot about how to play the position when you okay. play live football. Makes now, there sense. was a time when, when Ryan did, we, did, RD was coming off of, I mean, just a monster 2003 season or 2002 season, excuse me. And there was no way that RD was going to be live in fall camp, you know, two weeks before our first game. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, we were all live. And so we got, we, that system trained the quarterback position, how to know how to get rid of the football, how to protect yourself, when to take off and run. And I do think that that's one thing that I haven't seen much of at the college or NFL level uh, the best way to get good at playing quarterback is to play real football and, and, play and, and risk and the play. potential injury here and there and try to manage it as well as you can. But yeah, and sometimes, uh, hey, uh, Jordan Love, the stove's on, FYI. So if you get close there, it, it, it will burn you and you are going to get jacked up on this play. So th- that's kind of how it goes. It, it is. And and I think it's it's interesting because, you know, I've been a coordinator for head coaches and I brought up that idea to do that. And they thought I was absolutely crazy. I'm like, I mean, I played the position. I understand the position. I know what goes into it. Um, I do think that at some point in time, when you roll out, maybe even your second or third quarterback, if he hasn't gotten hit in three years, seriously, you know ugly yeah. that's gonna be. That's gonna be ugly. They never get and, hit. And 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 there were a lot of times where the head coaches that worked, if they were defensive head coaches, they're like, yeah, let's do it, yeah. And then they'd be like. Yeah, but let's not make Jordan Love live. And I'm like, but what about these other two or three guys, man? They're going to be like, Andrew Peasley? What about Peasley? Yeah, beat I mean, the hell out of Peasley. <laughs> and, and, and going to back to that, Johnny, it, it, it's it's funny that I have such a favorable view of that experience of having the quarterbacks be live to tackle, um, to play uh, real football. Going in 2004, my final season as a player at Boise State, you know, that quarterback competition between myself and Jared Zabransky was, it was truly neck and neck. Um, and I'll never forget, I think it was the second to last scrimmage um, before we were starting real football prep to open up with Idaho. Uh, we opened up with your, your Vandals in 2004. And you could, you could imagine what the outcome was. I mean, this is, you know, we didn't have all the fancy bells and whistles that the Broncos have now. And we were pretty even in terms of our resources at the time in 2004. But we know how that played out. But anyway, uh, in one of the live scrimmages, I had, there was a, a play that I had, and I was having a good fall camp. And I felt like, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to say I was outperforming Jared Zabransky because I think he did a, a phenomenal job that year. It was a really awesome, spirited competition between and he, he and was I. a sophomore and you were a fifth-year guy. I don't know yeah. if they said this, but just me from my couch, that's what I was saying. Like, if it's even Steven, yeah, maybe no you give it to the sophomore over the fifth-year guy. Sometimes yeah. coaches will do that. Sometimes it won't matter, I'm and, sure. And I think, and I think when, when you watch the Fiesta Bowl win, the first one, it, it that all come like that made perfect sense for me having lost that competition. I'm like this may not have happened if Z hadn't started as a sophomore. Yeah, you know he hadn't been in these situations for three years, and now it's Boise State on the largest stage that it's ever been on, and maybe will ever be on. You just you don't guys know. Went undefeated that year too, regular season, yep. regular season. So back to the the second to last scrimmage before we got into game prep, and you know this is one of those type of deals where. It was getting to decision time for Hawk and for Pete. And I remember I, I took off and ran and I was, you know, I was trying to win a dang job, Johnny. I mean, I wanted to yeah. win the starting job. I want to follow and, RD, man. Follow Bart. Like you want that position. Totally. And so I, I, I took off on a scramble, 
you know, mind you, I'm, I'm six, I'm a tall guy, right? So I'm six, four at the time I was probably at 220, 225 and I take off and there was a play either at the sticks in the red zone, like at the fourth down marker, or I think it might've actually been a goal line where I just sold, sold out my body to try to score a touchdown. And in doing so, I caught a helmet dirt flush right on my hip and it split the muscles, a true, like, so it split them all the way around. It was actually on my, my front hip, which is a rotational hip to throw the football. And so I had to get, I mean, it was nasty. I, I could woke up the next uh. morning, could, couldn't walk. And it, it, it ultimately was a hip pointer, which seems like a yeah, big deal. Yeah. Rebel dirt on it. Um, but it was hard because I had, to, I had to get that sucker shot up about three, four five times over the next two weeks. And I, I just said, I'm not going to miss any time, you know, when and, you and shoot so, it up, you don't feel anything or you, you have a uh, numb you leg everything. and then you have yeah, to adjust yeah. to that. Like, how do you, how do, how do players do that when they say, shoot me up? Like what? Well, that this was more of like a, it was, it was, it was to, to help the process. I don't remember what they shot me up with, but it was, okay. it, they shot me up to help the healing process to st- uh, essentially like spread the bruising out instead of having it all in one compact tight location. And so it, it, it really led to me just kind of going with a win one for the Gipper mentality for the next couple of weeks of training camp. And, you know, the next couple of weeks weren't, weren't very pretty. So, um, but those things you don't have a chance to talk about, you know, those are great. I love when we go back in time, because I say it every time on ball talk, like your era you know, RD and the fellas and just the winning and the dominating. Like, you didn't even know if you guys are watching. If you didn't watch last week, Sand- Sandman didn't even know that they led the nation in scoring for three consecutive years. Like, nobody in the building knew. It's just, I, I, it's just, it was just that, that was kind of like the mindset. Okay, gee, yeah. like, we're, yeah, that's cool. We are, but that's not what we're trying to do. What, what were you guys trying to do other than just, beat the crap out of your opponents and try to get some attention. It felt like, you know, t- would you say your arrow, do you guys have an inferior or inferiority complex? Would you say that about those teams? Maybe that hundred you know, percent yeah, short we, man we, syndrome, they yeah. call it kind of uh, like, it, yeah, we called it. I mean, the thing that we just talked about is playing with a chip on our shoulder, you know, before that was a in vogue term, you know, everybody was using, but we just wanted to carry that chip on our shoulder as a program, every game, you know, even, you know, we go play somebody who maybe everybody thinks we should do- destroy. And then we go and we see they have nicer facilities than us. They had, you know, at the time, especially you guys, um, would, you guys would take notes of that. Like, oh yeah. yeah okay. Oh yeah. And, okay. and, and, and the coaches would make, make note of it too, especially hockey. Mm-hmm. Let us know, um, you know, we don't have everything, even like San Jose state, you know, they had at the time it's like San Jose state has this, you know, they have they have more than we do. Their gear's nicer, whatever it may be. Yeah, and okay. And that pissed you off. Huh? You know, and it was just like that was the mentality we have. But more than that, more than the chip on our shoulder, it's funny. In 2000, about about a decade after I got done playing, uh, you know, at Boise State, I started hearing all this this stuff about Nick Saban uh really inventing this concept of uh the process. You've heard about the Nick Saban process, like process is always going to be greater than results. I've like read if his all book. you're concerned yeah. with is results, then you don't ever follow your process and stay disciplined within the process. And that was about a decade when that became, I think his book probably came out around 2014, 15, right in there. Um, but you know that came out and everybody's talking about, wow, this is amazing. I'm like, that's what we did back in the old days at Boise state is we didn't concern ourselves with the national narrative. We didn't concern ourselves with how many yards per game, how many points per game we had as an offense. We just kept playing. We kept practicing. We kept, you know, letting Jeff Pittman, our strength coach, whoop our ever living asses in the weight room. You know, that's just what we did. And so it was, it was like, we didn't, we didn't have to, you know, label it the process. We were the process and that's how the program was ultimately built. All right, let's get our BNN Bronco Brew Coffee mic drop coming. Sanford mic drop in 90 seconds. This is Ball Talk. All Bronco Nation news broadcasts come from the Cutwater Spirits Canned Cocktail Studios. Check out one of their more than 30 flavors of premix premium cocktails at your local gas station or grocery store. Cutwater Spirits, perfect for your next game day tailgate party. Our title sponsor is RowPaint.com. For all your commercial, industrial, residential painting needs, check out RowPaint.com. Don't forget about their concrete coatings. Transform that ugly concrete slab on your back patio in your garage in just one day. 
Contact RowPaint.com for a free estimate today. The official paint and coatings company of Boise State Athletics and our title sponsor at Bronco Nation News is RowPaint.com. Idaho Central Credit Union has been helping members achieve financial success for more than 80 years. There's an ICCU branch on almost every corner, but the closest is in your pocket with free e-branch mobile and online banking. See why more than 500,000 members love ICCU and join one in four Idahoans by making the switch today at ICCU. Since 1984, Ridley's Family Markets has prided itself on being a hometown food and drug store that employed value members of the local community. Ridley's Family Markets has 13 locations in the state of Idaho and many more in the surrounding states. Download the new Ridley's app to your smartphone, get savings up to 40% off at the checkout line, and find a location near you at shopridleys.com. Former Bronco Matt Bauscher is once again the number one ranked realtor in the Treasure Valley. No home is too big or too small for Matt and his team. Let them fulfill all your real estate needs at BauscherRealEstate.com. Bronco Brew Coffee Mic Drop. Get yourself a subscription to Bronco Brew Coffee now, right now. Just go sign up, get it dialed up, and then go figure out who you want your NIL uh, portion of that subscription to go to. It, could be an athlete, could be a particular team. It could just be the entire athletic department. Um, but to go out and get your Bronco Brew coffee and get elite fresh roasted beans, ground or whole bean, like I get it out here, and uh, you will not regret getting your Bronco Brew coffee. To the mic drop. So I was scrolling on the old X app, which I guess is Twitter is X. I'm uh, still not used to calling it that, but I did. So I'm scrolling on it the other day. I think it was yesterday, day before. Uh, I'm kind of looking through and you know, listening to you know little interviews coming out from from Boise State's week of spring practice, you know I do this every so often. There, you know, typically I listen to a couple words, listen to you know maybe some of the questions. Might see what uh, some of our media members are are covering with regards to the Boise State Bronco football team, and you know always preparing for this show. Um, but something stuck out to me that I haven't seen very often in my entire life of being around the game of football, and that was an individual that was interviewed. And this individual blew my mind. And the reason he blew my mind was because of how articulate he was, how uh, well-spoken, uh, leadership, uh, authenticity uh, just seemed real. And I, I think at times we can sometimes over-anoint people or criticize people based off of how they interact with the media. The thing I'm always looking for as a former coach and somebody who's always evaluating positional players, I look for authenticity. I look for real. And this particular player showed authenticity and showed an incredible amount of just being real and taking a lot of ownership and accountability for, you know, his one experience as a starting quarterback. And that's my guy, CJ Tiller. So let that film roll. Yeah. You know, I, I, I was, uh, to be honest, I was very upset. Like after leaving that game in the field, I, I thought I left so much on the field um, that I could have done a lot better. And, and that's every quarterback when you leave the field, you know, everybody could say it was your first star. You played UCLA number Ten defense in the nation, whatever they were. Um, like I, I don't really care who I'm in front of. Like you probably saw me on the film. I was talking smack and do all that. Like that's just me. Like that's who I am. But I, I left so much on the field, and, and when I walked off, I was I was disappointed because I felt like I left the guys down. Um, even though you know I don't want to look at. I mean I don't. I know they don't want me to look at it that way. Uh, but that's just what it is. I, I take full responsibility of that game. Um, I, I should have done a lot of things better, and I could I could have. But now I'm going to learn from it. Got this off season. Now we're going to build together as a team. Um, the chemistry with the O line, the receivers. Um, Obviously, the defense, too, being cool with those guys because at the end of the day, they're going to get us the ball back to be able to go down and score on the blue um, and have the whole stadium roaring. So uh, I was upset. I was upset after the game. But, you know, at the end of the day, I learned from it and um, I'm progressing forward now. That is an impressive young man. Uh, it's not just an impressive young man because, uh, you know, he speaks well, which he does. It's not just an impressive young man because he has the characteristics of the face of a program. Uh, he is a guy that would you know, uh, be a tremendous representation of, of Boise State in, in the university, the football program, the athletic department. But what I think is so special about that young man is that he was able to take himself back to that moment at UCLA uh, against, against the Bruins and Los Angeles Bull, reflect on it, um, take ownership, which we all know is so hard to find in sports these days, is coaches, players, taking full extreme ownership and accountability for their own actions, but then not carrying himself like somebody who is going to do it again. 
carrying himself like somebody who's going to learn from it. And what I look for when I'm evaluating quarterbacks and, and you're going through the evaluation process, I look for body language. And the biggest thing that I look for, and it's a term that, that I learned while coaching at University of Minnesota, is I look for a guy that has a big chest and he carries himself with broad shoulders. He's perked up. He's ready to interact with. And, he, and frankly, he's ready to move on. He's ready to learn from that, not forget about it, apply the lessons and move on. But I also think that I see a guy in C.J. Tiller that's going to be a great teammate. He's going to be uh, good with whatever ultimately happens. But I don't think I see a guy in C.J. Tiller that's just going to sit back and let it be all about just the Maddox Madsen versus Malachi Nelson show. I think C.J. Tiller is going to compete. I think C.J. Tiller is going to enter himself into this competition. And I think that the experiences that C.J. Tiller had at UCLA give me enough to see that interview to see how he took that accountability and to see where he can go with that type of mentality, that he's a guy that I'm going to keep my eye on as this thing gets closer to the regular season. And even during the regular season, in the event that something needs to happen at the quarterback position, CJ Tiller, you, my friend, you got my respect. And I am fully on board with CJ Tiller as a human being, as a quarterback, and a tremendous representation of my alma mater in a place that I love. Uh, you, my friend, are, are an impressive young man. That's the mic drop. That is a ter terrific example, too, Coach Sanford. And C.J. Tiller is a terrific example. No one would have thought twice if he entered the portal. People would have completely understood. What do you, What's it like because you have flat out been in this operation? You know, you show up at Boise State, Bart's the hero, and R.D. is in the room waiting and then bj roadie's kind of saying hey man don't let me get a chance i'm gonna play well too but those guys were all older than you and then when you start matriculating um legadunani shows up um jared zabransky the potato farmer from hurston oregon the two, the two of them up. were in the same class nick lomax oh my god neil lomax's son in portland he's like six seven i remember hearing the nick lomax buzz like can i stop you nick, there yeah Last night, Anne Marie and I have a have a, a staycation. We needed to get away from the kids for a night. So mommy and daddy went down to Denver, went to the Nuggets game. You know, we're, we're staying at a cool little place in downtown Denver. And we're sitting down, you know, at, at a at a watering hole right there in Denver. And guess who was sitting next to us? Nick Lomax. Nick Lomax's brother of all people. Like I haven't heard the name Nick Lomax in 20, you know, however many years been. 18 years and he's sitting next to us an amazing guy and we talked all about nick got the updates on everything nick was actually after me he was the class yeah. that came in the year after but um, yeah i'll never yeah. forget you know that and i told i told his brother yesterday i was like when he signed with boise state like that was huge he's like really i'm like in boise Oh, I mean, it was a massive story. Massive sign, Nick Lomax. They wanted him bad, and oh, absolutely. Um, but just being like in CJ Tiller's position, like, sure, at one point you're naive and you show up and you think it's going to be you at some point, and then as classes come and more quarterbacks come in, and you're like, well, what do you think was going through CJ Tiller's head through all this? And you know, you, you it seems like you went through stuff like that. All quarterbacks do, right? Yeah, from that from that actual interview, we listened to it before we went on air with BJ's. You heard the clip that was asked about TG ten, you know, and and what was going on with him. And yeah. basically, it sounded like CJ knew that TG was going to be transferring uh, two weeks before it maybe became public consumption. Is kind of how I read the quote. Um, and in doing so, you know, number one that acknowledges that. You know, obviously, CJ and TG10 were very close, as most quarterback rooms are. Uh, but I also think that he did know that that was going to be reality. And uh, I guarantee you that a guy like CJ Tiller that carries himself the way he does, albeit, you know, did he do everything in the bowl game that he believes he's capable of doing as a quarterback? No, he's he was a freshman. He was thrust into that position um, really with, with strange circumstances and against a really good defense. But I do think that he did know that it would be – at the time, it would be Maddox Madsen and him duking it out in 2024. And then you add, you know, you yep. add this, this massive transfer in Malachi Nelson. And let's not forget, Malachi Nelson and C.J. Tiller, they're in the same class. 
They like, are. That's the I know. same recruiting class. They and both redshirted last year. They're both now redshirt freshmen. Yeah. They're in the, they were in the same class. And, uh, you know, I think the, the impressive thing, I do know that those two know, knew each other well. Uh, they trained together with Danny Hernandez, who's, I think, one of the best, if, the, if not the best, mm. quarterback trainers in the country. He's out of Southern California. Um, so I, they know each other. They have familiarity. They probably have friendship. You know, they probably yeah. have, they probably competed with each other. They probably get along with each other. Um, but in this day and age of uh, taking my ball and leaving, if I don't like what I have or I don't like the way the situation has has transpired, uh, what you're seeing in a guy like C.J. Tiller is I'm not taking my ball. I'm going to actually put the ball in my hands and I'm going to go out and show that I can compete and be the guy. And I think that's exactly what's going on. Now, am I saying that C.J. Tiller is going to be the starting quarterback at Boise State? No way. I'm not there. I don't see it. I don't see the practices. I don't have enough information to say that, but I'm talking about just what I saw from uh, a guy that's that's very self-reflective, but also very confident and carries himself in a confident manner. I do think that he will factor into this quarterback competition and quarterback distribution of reps somehow, some way in the 24 season. I believe that's going to happen. It's weird because, you know, I, I've been to every single practice and I've stayed the entire time on every single practice. Um, and I'll, BJ even knows I've been to more practices than BJ has. Um, I just want to throw that in there. But no, it feels like CJ Tiller's like the middle child because first off, the when you go out to practice and you're watching the quarterbacks go through their indies, and then they pair up with the receivers, then they invite the DBs over. Just when you watch that sequence and those the first thing you want to see Malachi, you want to see the prized yes. piece, the bonus baby. You want to see how good he is. So, okay, great. But then you go to Maddox cause he's bout, he's not even wearing a brace anymore. Sandman. Yeah, he's, he's crazy. Playing. Like yeah, he's playing, yeah. but not going through live reps. Yeah. Um, he's doing everything, but the full on live, which is almost everything. And then there's CJ Tiller. Who's right there. Who's making his plays too. I can't honestly sit here and tell you, that CJ Tiller isn't playing better or worse than the other two. They're all kind of there right now. And I'm not saying CJ Tiller will start either. I don't, I wouldn't put money on him that he will, but I mean, he's factoring in and like you write that, that, that mic drop example there, just like that's the type of person he is. That yeah. dude's in your building every day. Yeah. That dude's in your quarterback room every single day sometimes you know personalities like that and level of enthusiasm sometimes that can be contagious and some quarterbacks we've seen and you know this some quarterbacks have that you know that quarterback face they've been the cool guy since kindergarten and they just know how to operate being the quarterback they get it they know that you know the the other dudes on the team are envious you know most maybe some of the girls think you know they think they're cute compared to some of the other players it's just the kind of the the responsibility that goes with being a quarterback some can pull that off some don't need to and that's fine too however however you can operate the position but CJ Tiller is going to be a guy that, and there's some B-roll here from BJ. Malachi. Um, that's Malachi. Um, I saw that play, by the way, live, Chase Penry. Oh, I did want to say this, Coach. And anyway, to, to sum that up, yeah, CJ's been right in the mix in spring. But your boy, Chase Penry there, Coach, he makes plays every single practice. And I don't know where he factors in in a he'll receiver room in. that yeah, I don't know in. has ever – huh? He'll factor in for sure. It no, feels no he question. makes plays. He gets open. He jaws with defensive backs. I saw a DB. It was a play in the end zone, and, and, it, and it was incomplete. And Penry was like, he said to the guy something like, do you have any idea how bad you hold? You hold me every play. And then the DB started firing back, and you see that stuff every day. But Penry, uh, Penry gets after it. I, yep. Again, it's, it's a loaded receiver room, and I guess we'll finish up real quick on ball talk going into that receiver room. We looked at the stats, BJ, throw those back up again, or or you can keep with the B-roll. This is fine, too, of highlights. But, you know, last week you built us a running back room. Just kind of in relation to that, Sandman, build us a receiver room. Yeah, I'd I would start with looking at the receiver, from, uh, the receiver room from three positions, and I'll use what – I'd say majority of offenses around around college football and in the NFL, you, you know, call their positions. And we'll start with the guy that's got to be your number one receiver is your X receiver. Yep. And the X receiver 
in from my evolution of building receiver rooms, it used to be the X receiver is just the big guy, the guy that's the split end. He's into the boundary. He wins one on one, you know, type of battles with the ball in the air. Um, he's willing to, to get downhill and block a safety, uh, put his face on a guy on outside run, outside zone, you know, pin and pull. But w- one thing that I I was I was I, I was transformed at University of Notre Dame because our ex receiver was Will Fuller. And Will Fuller is not a massive human. He's small. He, in person, he's very small. He's, he's but, thin. But, he looks kind of frail, but first round pick. He was. Yeah. yeah, he was thin. He was frail. And it, frankly, he wasn't very tall. He was like six foot, six one. But one thing that he was is that I want my ex to be the number one receiver. And it starts with speed. You've got to be able to blow off the top. There's got to be a guy in your receiver room that absolutely scares the living crap out of a defensive coordinator. And I think that all great vertical passing games start with the premise of somebody who's going to gain that attention. And if you're so arrogant as a defensive coordinator to say, eh, I'm just going to play what we play and not really worry about that guy who can blow the top off the coverage, then we're going to feed that X. That X is going to get the rock. But what happens is when you have an, an X with elite receiver traits and speed, they do oftentimes uh, create that deep crosser uh, for the F or the Z receiver because you do get double coverage. You pull the safety and the corner in, in a, any type of two shell or even single high defense. And then it allows for your other receivers to catch some of those 18 to 25 yard intermediate uh, deep crossing co- type concepts underneath a big post. So your X receiver's got to be your war daddy. He's got to be your dog. And he's also got to have the mentality of somebody that if that ball's in the air, you know what? Screw you. I'm getting that sucker. And and Junior Adams, one of my favorite guys, one of the best receiver coaches, if not the best receiver coach in college football, he calls them, he calls them FCDs, man. He, he, the X has got to be an FCD. He's a Frisbee catching dog. <laughs> Think about it, man. If you, if you launch a Frisbee, you want a, you want a dang dog that... <laughs> Jumps in I miss Junior oh. Adams, man. Yeah. Lost my mic right there for a second. Hold on. I miss Junior Adams, man. He was, he was um, on that 2014 staff. Yeah, jumps, I got you, man. Jumps yeah, in I got the air you. and makes a dang play. Um, and then you want your, your Z receiver. That'd be your other outside receiver. You want your Z receiver to be a guy that is the absolute jack of all trades as a, as a true route runner. Like You want a guy that understands – you know, the intermediate to kind of deeper inter- intermediate cuts, the in breakers, your digs. You want a guy that's comfortable, you know, catching those dagger concepts, which is really running from 15, you know, sharp cut 18 to 22 across the middle. Your Z's got to be a guy that's got to be a third down converting son of a gun. And that's yeah. where I think Chase Penry could come into play. Uh, full skill set. They've got the ability to, to, to catch the ball over the middle, but more importantly, they got the tenacity and almost uh, naivete to catch the ball over the middle because that's just who they are. Uh, but then I think your F receiver is what a lot of people call your slot. Some people call them an H, uh, but your F receiver's got to be a guy uh, that has all the knack and feel and, frankly, the, the little twitch to just know where to get open how to settle into zones, mm. uh, how to That's understand. Huge, huh? Yeah. And, and the guy that I see is like the most undervalued receiver that I evaluated at the, at the NFL uh, combine and senior bowl is Roman Wilson um, from Michigan. Yeah. He fits the F. I mean, he is just such a smart football player. He is so savvy. He he knows how to uh, attack leverage you know, he's obviously got athleticism, but he's not the guy that's going to run a four two nine forty. He's not six foot one. He's he's short. He's he's not a big guy. Yeah. Your F has got to be a guy that um, not only is is able to understand zones and how to break down zones, but also is, is somebody that you can utilize in your run game. Um, you know, and that's who Shane Williams Rhodes was for us Ooh. in 2014. You yeah. know, a guy that you can you can you can use your as your reverse guy, your gadget guy. He was you like know, third or fourth on your team in rushing that year. Yeah, it, it, and a lot of times it's not necessarily the fastest guy, but they understand how to get the hard yards. You mm-hmm. know that your your F has got to lead your team and run after catch. You know your X is going to use his speed to create those big explosive plays by by running the route to a certain depth and catching the football when it's up in the air. Your Z is going to use his route running uh, it, to to move the sticks, and then your F has got to be the guy 
uh, that not only understands zones, but can definitely create run after catch. And sometimes a, a five yard throw down the field, when you throw it to a really good F, it moves the sticks, even if it's third and 12. Totally, and a lot of people man. get pissed and, off when a coordinator calls a route that is shorter than 12 yards. Well, guess what? They're defending the part of the field that's at 12 exactly. yards really well. And I, so I you love coordinators. I love coordinators who call plays a, a, a quick slant or something quick, even though you need 12 guards, guys or 12 yards. Make one guy miss. You put the ball in some of these dudes' hands, coach, you make one guy miss, and all of a sudden, I mean, you're, that's a big splash chunk play of yards. Um, got another question about the receiver room. Wonder if you've ever dealt with this because, um, and PJ can hop on here if he wants to. He reported this last week. I've talked to him as well. Kobe Young. The Boise State basketball player wants <laughs> to stay on campus. He wants to join the football team. He was a three-star coming out. It was COVID. It was confusing. What not was what we hear a hell of a receiver there at, I believe, Pasco High School there in the in the Tri-Cities. But he, he wants to stay in Boise. He wants to switch sports completely, but he's not going to walk on. He needs Spencer Danielson to give him a scholarship and He's waiting for Spencer Danielson to kind of get back to him after spring to say if they have a scully together. You've been at a lot of places. <laughs> um, ever deal with and how have you dealt with the the superior basketball star athlete or whatever who wants to join the football team on scholarship and make up for all that lost ground? I actually had the exact same situation happen after my first year at Western Kentucky as the head coach. Uh, the guy that I loved on the basketball team going and supporting the, the, the Hilltopper basketball program uh, was, I think his name was Justin Johnson, if I'm not mistaken, but he was Did a they local make the tournament that year. No, no, okay. but uh, it was 2017. Okay. Um, they, they were good. They're competitive, but uh, didn't make the tournament. Uh, but he, just it was just in something. It don't matter. But um, six foot seven, two hundred and forty five pounds was was the ultimate scrapper. You know, the loose ball guy, the lay it on the line guy. Fairly skilled in the post. Fairly skilled shooter. Uh, still is playing actually in Europe uh, right now as a you know as a professional basketball player. But yeah. uh, I, I I just flat out just brought up the idea of him playing football, playing tight end. So he came out for spring ball. He 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 flat out did it. Basketball coach Rick Stansbury hated my guts for it. Uh, it was awesome, you know. Everybody, there's all kinds of drama in the Hilltopper athletic department. The kid Good. wanted to play. He wanted to give football a run for his money. Uh, and you and, were saying, and, "Hey, you you have a shot here." I mean, what? Sure. How did you sell it? Like, I, well, I think you, I mean, you know, of course, like everybody, you say, "Yeah, Antonio Gates, man." Yeah. And, and then and then at boy, at, excuse me, at Western Kentucky. It, it was the same thing. Their best basketball player three years prior to that was George Fant, the, who ended he's up being in an the league. Tackle. Yeah, he's started, I mean, tons Did of you games. Coach him? Did you tackle. coach Fant? He, he was, he never played football. You're right. He never played football at college. You're right. He, he was a, he was a WKU Hilltopper basketball player. Crazy. So th th this young man that came out and competed, Justin, um, you know, first couple of days of spring ball, he just looked like a fish out of water, man. I am just, I mean, as, as much as you could imagine, just not feeling comfortable. Yeah. You know, he had, I think he had one highlight reel, like one handed catch that went viral, at least in, in, you know, South central Kentucky. Um, but he just wasn't good, man. As a, it yeah. wasn't a good fit. He didn't understand leverage. He didn't understand, you know, how to drop his weight. Uh, the, the run blocking part of it, the pass blocking part of it was such a huge uphill battle. And uh, about halfway through spring, I just I was like, "Hey, man, for your future, you have another year of basketball. Um, it's probably just best yep. for you to do it." So, I would be really, really cautious in general um, with as deep as this receiver room is. And we haven't even talked about Marshall and Camper. The I know, transfers. man. I would be really careful with the scholarship. I, I mean, with as much piece, with as many pieces as you have in the receiver room, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then knowing that you got a louder at tight end. I would say bolster up that tight end room if you do have a couple extra scholarship spots uh, for the portal. So that'd be All that'd right. be mine. Let's get to some questions and we'll wrap up Ball Talk Spring Edition episode four. First one uh, from your boy Bronco Blameyer Sandman. Can you see Penry getting a third or higher slot on the depth chart or ceiling rotational situational receiver? You know, I, I could see you know Matt Miller in, in being from the, the 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 tree that that I would say I'm, I'm from as well. We I mean we'd certainly you know played there when I was when I was co coaching at Boise State. 
you don't really look at the receiver position as being set in stone day one. Um, you know, you look at the, there, it's a fluid position. There's unique skill sets that each receiver does have, you know, a guy like Matt Miller will have his hands full and will have a full job of rotating receivers in the course of a game. Uh, yeah. and, and, and sometimes you just hear, you know, uh, there's a hurt, a certain route get, get that gets called and you're like, Oh, Hey, get in there, Penry. Um, that's, he runs that route the best. And, you know, junior Adams is, is he coached. I don't know if you know this junior Adams coached Matt Miller or, or knows Matt Miller, um, you know, from the Montana world, Montana state, that's where junior was at. And junior was a big like audition, not for your spot in the, in the pecking order or the depth chart audition for who runs routes the best. Like it's a job interview for who runs the best post corner route, who runs the best, uh, bang eight. Who runs the best, um, you know, option routes, and and you audition for him. And so, as a as a receiver coach, it's a tough job on game day. You're on the headset. Sometimes the personnel groupings are called specific for players to be in those positions, and then sometimes you just got to react quickly and have your receiver right next to you and scream at him to go sprint on and and get on the field. So I think that'll be part of how Chase Penry's development will go early on in the year. Uh, I, I can't speak to how he'll compare to the rest of the of the room. Uh, I haven't seen all of them side by side, so I'm not going to oversell or undersell Chase Penry. But I will say this, his yep. competitiveness, his intelligence, he's going to be a big part of the plans in 2024. Yeah, pushing a lot of players. How would you utilize Sire? I mean, and, and I would say this, the plan is for him to redshirt. So you get four games plus a bowl game or postseason, what have you. How do you how do you do that when you tell a kid we're gonna redshirt you, but we plan on playing you those four games? How's that work? Well, I think the thing that you and I last week we broke down the perfect, the ideal uh, uh, running running back room. This week we did receiver room. Um, you know, we talked about the one and the three should look like each other, right? And now your one is Ashton Genty, and so it really becomes to me about Sire is does he end up becoming a viable three? And if he is a viable three then when you need those touches to spell Ashton Genty, you don't necessarily always give it to your two. And your two, a lot of times, like we talked about, is more your speed guy, your catch the ball out of the backfield guy, your screen guy, you know, your, your outside hitting run play guy. Um, and I see that as Breezy Dubar. Um, so I think the competition really for Asire Gaines is to see if, if he's the best three. Well, if he is the best three, you'll find that out by using those four games of red shirt or not red shirt in that kind of a testing capacity. Um, so I think he'll end up pushing uh, for that three spot. Uh, I'm drawing a blank right now on on the guy that was the Caden Dudley. Dudley, sorry, Caden. He's Dudley, in the mix but, too. He's yeah, in the I'd mix say, too. I'd say that Caden Dudley and Sire Gaines might battle it out for who's the three. Um, and if, if it's, if it's close, then you always err on the side of giving it to the guy that's been in the battles and been in the, you know, in the fires and that's Caden Dudley. He's done it as a special teamer. Uh, yep. He's done it as a returner and he's done it on the field. I mean, he played quite a bit last year as a, as a running back on the field. So, um, it would take for a sire gains to show that he has, um, plus traits that maybe mimic that of Ashton Janty. And that's pretty hard to do. Um, but I do think that that's how he will be most likely evaluated. Do you think they try to make some roster moves with the portal this summer? I guess that would be after spring, right? I mean, does it open up? Yeah, so there's another portal uh, window. I, I, you know, I fled college football pretty quickly, so I don't know the exact dates. I fled for the reason of all of these dates of right. when this portal <laughs> it opens and people just start flying into it. Um, I, you know, it is a, there's a summer window. It's typically a very uh, it's a lighter. Uh, movement time but shoot there's going to be movement of guys leaving you know the programs after spring ball you know they might not be figuring into the reps that they thought they were or they might not like their team yep. there might be some quarterbacks that don't like the new coordinator that just got hired at certain places I, I they don't you know the style of offense doesn't fit my play so it's it's going to be fluid there always is some fluidity and there's some movement in July uh, June and July I would say that, you know, Boise State's probably going to use the data that they are able to attain from this spring ball to then push forward and make some decisions about how to put forward uh, a roster that's worthy of competing for the group of five spot in the playoffs. And that's what has to be the reality with a window that Boise State does have. You know, we talk about it a lot here in Denver. Um, the Avs right now playing the Stars. Like, there are very set 
windows of opportunity, championship windows, if you will, Johnny. And I do think that this is a championship window for Boise State with a guy like Ashton Genty and this many returning players. I agree. Uh, Coach, remember when your dad was at UNLV, got him to the cusp of bowl eligibility, biggest win. I remember this one at Arizona State in overtime. Yeah, and they were ranked number eight. Arizona that State was the was UNLV experience uh, from your perspective. That was cool. I just uh, give them historical background because there was Urban Meyer with his two guys, Winningham in the San Sanford. Yes. And uh, so, so I guess I sound like Lenny talking to uh, George on Of Mice and Men. Tell him, hey, tell him the story about Tame and the Rabbits, George. Yeah, but. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just that, that whole experience with your dad. Yeah, so, so Urban Meyer hired my dad to be his offense coordinator at UNL or excuse me, at Utah. Um, and my dad had worked with Urban Meyer at Notre Dame uh, mm -hmm. about five years prior in 1997, uh, right in there, 97, 98 at Notre Dame. And so, uh, my dad went to Utah, uh, you know, and, and they did a lot of the stuff offensively that, my dad and Urban had talked about wanting to do while they were studying Rich Rodriguez at a uh, small college out in somewhere in West, not University of West, not West Virginia, but there was another small school that Rich Rodriguez was running spread option uh, principles from the shotgun with the quarterback, you know, and at Notre Dame, they had Jarius Jackson. So my dad and Urban had started this process. Urban did it full go at Bowling Green with Greg Brandon as his offensive coordinator. Then we got the head job at Utah. Greg Brandon became the head coach at Bowling Green. Oh, so my dad needed an offensive coordinator. Uh, Urban needed an offensive coordinator. Hired my dad. Uh, they ended up winning every single game. Uh, my dad's second year there. Really Alex, good there, man. Alex Smith, they were Brian running, Johnson. They were running. They were running stuff that no one had ever seen. Like you're saying, no. D three stuff. Like I remember Alex Smith in shotgun doing this. It was read, Glendale State, and he's Glendale keeping State. it all these times. Like they're running with him. Quarterbacks yep. don't run. Like all the play action stuff. Like it was cutting edge stuff. Your dad and Urban Meyer at Utah. I loved those teams, man. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so then Kyle Whittingham was the defensive coordinator. He'd been a D-line coach. I mean, he was Mr. Utah, um, you know, guy that had mm -hmm. played it at BYU, grew up in Utah. His dad was a coach at BYU, um, was really, really connected with all the po the uh, pipeline of recruiting uh, Polynesia, uh, all of it, Samoa Huge. and Tonga. Yep. Um, and so Kyle Whittingham got the head coaching job. There was, there was a little bit of an unknown time when Urban took the Florida job, uh, whether it was going to be Whittingham or Sanford. Um, but ultimately, Kyle Whittingham clearly was was Mr. Utah and still is here. I and mean, that was so right. long ago. Uh, yeah. Certainly the longest tenured coach uh, <laughs> that I mean that I know in Power Behind Five Ferenc. football. I think Kirk Ferentz is Kirk the Ferenc, only yeah. And yeah. That's it. But uh, yeah, so my dad got the head job at UNLV, followed his old uh, college coach, John Robinson, and a guy that he had worked for. Uh, you know, but the program at UNLV last season was really one of the first like real winning seasons that programs had for years. Um, so I went there when it was a, a massive build I mean, it was from the ground, um, you know, went through some really tough years. I was there for two, two win seasons, um, but it was really fun to watch the program uh, get to the point of being really competitive to the point where they went to ASU and knocked off Dennis Erickson's number eight ranked uh, team. And, yeah. um, you know, well, my dad ended up going five and seven in back to back years close to breaking that barrier of getting to a bowl game. Uh, the original athletic director that had hired my dad, Mike Hamrick, left to go to West Virginia or to go to Marshall as the athletic director, which was his alma mater and the new AD just kind of did the deal where, oh, this isn't my guy. And yeah. I, I think if, if my dad had been given a couple more years, I think they would have really broken through. And, and he was building it the right way. He just, he got five years, but um, I think he needed about seven. I know it sounds crazy in this day and age, but to, to break through. Yeah, it, that I, I was a TA there for two years. Um, I had a lot of fun. I was newly married, so it was uh, not the typical Vegas experience for a 23-year-old. Um, it was a lot of, I mean, a lot of, you know, my wife and I, we went to the casino one time. We gambled away our whole uh, GA stipend check of $400 <laughs> for the entire month. And so we learned a hard lesson that you don't gamble. So we didn't really gamble after that. Haven't really yeah. since. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just a, a great place to live. And my dad and mom loved it so much that my dad kind of chose to to make that his permanent home in his 60s and going forward. So he's the head coach now in the Vegas area up in Summerlin at Faith Lutheran. Uh, and Faith Lutheran just went to the state championship. And I think they're going to win the son of a gun this year.
Hell yeah, man. Well, um, I think that's it, guys. Ball Talk, Spring Edition, Episode 4. I think we got through another one, man. Hey, appreciate you, man. That was uh, hey, and actually, I appreciate you for for gutting it out today. A little, a little under the weather, and you know what? You're a pro's pro, man. You're not going to make coach. any excuses. So, um, I, I, you know, I believe in you. I believe in your toughness, your grit, your ability to enter the arena when needed. You showed that on pro day. You're not afraid, man. You put the headset on, and and you know, like putting the helmet on, you know, as yep. a coach, or putting the headset on headset. as a coach. <laughs> it's it's game headset. Time. It's game time. Game time. time to go. All right. Time we'll catch go. you, uh, I think, next week, Spring Edition, Episode 5. Yeah. And, and talk. Over the next week, I want you to really, I want you to really evaluate um, pass rushers this week in practice. Okay. What you I'll see out attention. of pass rushers, particularly edge pass rushers. Okay. I'll pay attention. I know Ahmed's not playing in spring. That's a bummer, but there's a lot of guys out there. And I don't see, I, I don't see Hassanine. Uh, in in the he's more of an interior pass rushing threat. I'm talking about like those ballistic edge rushers. And uh, uh -huh. is, ben, is 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 Benefield going spring ball? Dude, he's everywhere. Yeah, yeah that guy's, that guy's awesome. gonna be on the field. I actually see that guy as, as even from wherever he's playing safety, nickel, and uh, he could be an elite pass rusher. I mean, I'm Ty talking Benefield. Elite. Just yeah, okay, okay. Ty Benefield, I, yeah. I'm just talking about like it's funny like e even this past year watching the Denver Broncos when they got home it was actually Justin Simmons he's an unbelievable blitzer from the safety position knows how to get home knows how to get guys on the ground okay and finally you know I'm not some Nirvana poser I didn't just go down to the record exchange and buy this shirt I've had it for years uh, Sanford we grew up kind of when the grunge era was getting going oh, yeah. living in Seattle then um, I, I have a million, I mean, Nirvana, uh, I don't want to, I'll just say this. How about the Nevermind album? So I'll good. go smells like teen spirit. You can't, I mean, bloom, it's so good. Mm. Come as you are. Breed, All apologies. Lithium, Polly. That's the first six songs on Nevermind alone. How about so, all uh, yeah, apologies? Was, all apologies. Love that song. Does that did they do all apologies when they did the unplugged MTV album? unplugged? Oh, that beautiful that's the, song. That's the all greatest apologies. Hell yeah! I could play that riff. Music I could too. I could play that riff on the guitar now. You play guitar? I used to. How do you I, have the I would time? Never, I, well, it was before I was a college athlete. It was That's back in high good. school, man. I was just trying to oh. live the full punk rock surfer skater vibe of SoCal, man. Oh man, yeah, California, cool. I love it. Yeah. All right, oh, guys, yeah. we'll 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 catch you on the next edition. Until then, keep subscribing to BNN and uh, you know, show BJ appreciation for his work. Listen to KTIK, the ticket for me and Prater every day on Idaho Sports Talk, and catch the Sandman wherever he is this week for a quick update. How do they find you tomorrow, man? Uh, Monday, 10 to noon, Altitude Sports Radio. Got the app if you want to tune in. It doesn't know it doesn't conflict with your airtime, I don't believe. So oh, uh, check you know, out. You, you can get a little two for a little you can get a little sandman and a little ball hey. game the same day. Hey, and DU then, is in the frozen four. You guys the, got about, a lot to talk how about. about. DU, DU's in their 19th frozen four in program history. And DU 19th. hockey is a is a thing in Denver. The I Pios, didn't realize baby. this. Pios. Yeah, hey, uh, and then uh, tune in on Vsin, which is actually taped and hosted uh, at Circa, a title sponsor mm -hmm. for us here uh, at Bronco Nation News. But uh, I'm on every Tuesday on Vsin. You can catch it on it's on national television. Uh, I'm on with Tim Murray in their primetime show, uh, usually 15 or 30 minutes. Uh, I'll be on uh, at 4:45 uh, Mountain Time tomorrow or on Tuesday. So I love all the they're, they're putting you to work, man. And yeah. uh, Always catch you here on BNN, you guys. Uh, enjoy the your Sunday night, and uh, see you next time on Ball Talk. Sounds good, my man. Yeah! Yeah!